On the few subsidy matters, you know, different perspectives, so many things happening real quick. Well, again, all this time we've got uh, Mr. Shamsuddin Usman, the Minister of National Planning. Thank you for coming on this morning. Thank you very much. Well, it's interesting in the light of what seems to be playing itself out. So basically, the plan that the people see there, they just can't help but ask themselves, what kind of plan is this that government has that's it's gotten everyone on the streets? In fact, some say, uh, even though they travel for the festive seasons, they're finding it very difficult to come through. This, they say, is not a well thought out plan. Well, I think, first of all, uh, let me clear quickly something that I was told happened. I hope I'm, I've been told correctly. That when my colleague yesterday, who appeared in this program, uh, the, my respected colleague, Professor Chuku, the health minister, uh, just left the panel somebody was asking why are they sending the Minister of Health to be the one to talk to us about world subsidy, why not uh, the ministers in charge of uh, the economy and so on and so forth. I, I think first of all to say on behalf of uh, Professor Chuku who is a very close friend of mine that he's a thoroughbred professional and if Nigerians know what this guy is doing for our health sector honestly, but that's the, the subject of a different story one day I'm sure he will come and tell it but the point is that every minister, yes it is the responsibility of the president to take the final painful decision, that is what he was elected to do but we members of the Federal Executive Council because these issues are discussed at the Federal Executive Council it's our responsibility to explain to Nigerians so it doesn't have to be ministers of the economy in fact what we've agreed is the responsibility of every minister to actually go out and explain to Nigerians uh, because you know it's a pain that we are all bearing and sharing together I, I just thought I should make that point now coming back I think it's very good the way you ask this question. We need to put things in a proper perspective. This is part of a general reform that is taking place in government business, in the economy. Uh, so that's why we like to actually refer to it as the reform or the deregulation of the petroleum downstream. Uh, people see it as just the removal of oil subsidy. It's part of a big picture. Yes, this is what people are seeing today. But the way I put it, again, you see, I'm an economist, but I don't want today to start reeling out figures and statistics because we have come to the point where we need to explain this thing in very simple language so that the average Nigerian understands what the issues are. And I'm going to use, in fact, quite interestingly, a medical analogy to say that we had a situation where the mother of the family was very sick with a life-threatening illness. And the head of the family called a meeting, family meeting. We discussed, this member of the family said, oh, she's not even really ill. Another one said, oh, she's suffering from something, but it is not what you think. It is witches that are hunting her. We have to find those witches and kill them and do something before she recovers. Others say, what type of operation? Caesarean, I mean, sorry, a simple knife or use laser and so on and so forth. The head of the family listened to all these things. And because it is his responsibility to take the final painful decision, because the patient is on life-threatening ailment, he took the decision to get the operation done. It's been done. So we are in a post-operative stage now. And what we do is also very critical to the revival of the patient. Some people are talking of shutting down. It's almost the same as, again, using medical terminology. The patient post-operative is on life support. And somebody is saying, I will go and switch off the life support machine. We know what will happen. People have a right to protest. People have a right to have different opinions that you cannot deny from them. This is a democratic setting. The president clearly is not a sadist. He is not trying to inflict pain on Nigerians. But we look at what is the counterfactual. All 
all the areas, you see, I have been around for so long, so that some people start saying, I hope some people do not say, I'm also one of the expired people who should not even be <laughs> coming here. You know, well, Dr. Usman, you, you, you've used the medical, you've tried another analogy. There are many analogies that, you know, would depict what exactly is going on here. Yesterday, Professor Chukwu tried one, and he said that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's like a gangrene taking over a patient's leg, and you, it's the decision of the medical doctor to decide to amputate that, because if it doesn't, it's going to take over the entire body. And the question that was put back at him was, even in that particular situation, the patient discusses with the doctor. The doctor has to win the confidence of the patient that that particular action is in the best interest of the patient. And you don't just cut off the leg. And when finally the patient agrees, you put some anesthetic there because the patient will definitely feel some pain. We asked what the anesthetic the federal government had given this particular time. We were still in the middle of this the particular discussion, or so a host of people assumed, because the same people who appeared at the NPAN uh, de uh, debate, as it were, were the first people to take to the streets. Meanwhile, we were told by Professor Moye that they all agreed, and it was very clear that even though they did agree, they did so <coughs> based on certain conditions which haven't been met. Well, I think first of all, uh, it is very important to understand that sometimes what happens behind closed doors is different from what people come and say. So, and I don't want to go into that point at this stage of who says this, who said what, what agreements have been reached. The issue of removal of poor subsidy, if we can come to that, is something that has been on the drawing board for such a long time in this country. Even the discussion under this administration, and I've been part of all of it, you know, uh, the, with the labor unions, right from the days of Eradua. Yes, in fact, in the first part of the section, the news part, I heard you say specifically about the point that uh, there was a time when in fact oil prices were very low, lower than actually what would have arrived even with the, direct, uh, with the, with the regulated price. And that was a fantastic opportunity for us to have done what we, we needed to do. And one of the questions people ask, why didn't we? Now, part, uh, people against sometimes have short memories. We didn't, unfortunately, because the person who needed to take the final decision because we are, we, this is a presidential system. At the end of the day, it's the president of the country on a matter like this that is so is serious for the country. He is the one who has the final responsibility. And people have forgotten the state of health of Eradua at the time. I can say to you that that was the critical thing that prevented that decision. Now we have another president who is very courageous. I think people should admire the courage of the president. There's really no good time or bad time for a decision like this. The, the analogy I use is not even a gangrene leg. It's, 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 it's a heart that is really very bleeding and, 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 and the patient is in danger of dying. And you have to take that decision. The decision has been taken. The doctor is on, I mean, the patient is on life support. You don't remove the life support. Uh, um, so. let, let, and okay. what you need to give them some, yes, palliative medication to tie them over. And it is the period when, in fact, during recovery, that the pain is most, uh, you feel the pain most. Well, Dr. Usman, let me come in here because uh, since you've said that we shouldn't even bring loads and loads of figures and we should just see how we can explain it so that everyone can understand it. Some have been asking this question knowing full well for, uh, that uh, you've been with the government uh, over time and you just uh, uh, alluded to that fact. How come the subsidy suddenly increased from maybe 300 uh, to about $1 trillion plus? No, but the increase we're talking about now, is it as a result of more cars on our roads or because the power sector just couldn't function, we had more generating sets to power those generating plants? Again, I think you are, you are dragging me back to the, the statistics and the figures. I will explain that one to say that it's a combination of two or three things. The first one, obviously, is that oil prices themselves, international oil prices, were rising. And the, the, the subsidy will become bigger every time the dollar price of fuel internationally increases. You know, it's, it's just simple arithmetic. 
They also the volume consumed. There is some controversy about the volumes. I'm sure if you saw the debate, the town hall debate about Governor Senussi of CBN and so on, gave figures. Is it 35 million liters per day or is it 50 whatever that as people are claiming? Now that is part of the problem this thing is supposed to cure. As long as you have a distortion in the marketplace that creates an incentive for people to cheat, they will cheat. People have said, gather all the people that are doing this. Now, first of all, yes, there is a, a fuel mafia. But not every one of them has been cheating. And in any case, we have tried this before in this country. Gather them, lock them up. You know, yeah, if, if the president just wanted cheap pop, uh, popularity, that's one, thing, one, one, way, one way to go about it. Gather everybody, lock them up, and the first thing that happens is bef b until you have some alternative way of importing petroleum in this country, you will create a serious shortage that will cripple the country. The second is that over time, the success of reform shows that don't go after the symptom. Go after the cause of the disease. If you looking up this thing, I have been part of reform. I was the first director general of the TCPC that started privatization. People have very short memories. There was a time in this country when government decided that certain goods were uh, uh, essential commodities, salt, sugar, milk. What happened? Long queues at the cooperative shops for people to buy a bag of salt. Ordinarily, you don't need more than a bag of salt in a year. But you went, up, you went and bought two bags and ordered. What happened? Government get, got out of that business. Because you don't need government to, to dictate to you how many bags of salt or how many uh, cartons of sugar you need to buy. What happens? You go to the market today and buy your sugar. Government at one time owned hotels, owned other commercial ventures. When we started privatization, Federal Palace Hotel here, people, we had a situation where the minister, government officials had suites permanently booked in the hotel at, at public expense. Today, if you want to go to Federal Palace Hotel, I'm a minister. If I go there and I want a suit, I have to pay for it. Okay, so so <coughs> this, this, is, this is really, that's the picture that I'm talking about.